Good morning. I hope you guys had a beautiful Christmas and Happy New Year. This, uh, the holiday season is, is something. Uh, it comes with all kinds of different experiences for us. It comes with, uh, some of us are just jam-packed full of schedule, and some of us get to slow down and just kind of breathe for a moment. There's something about celebrating with a group of people. You look all throughout humanity and like we are a people who, who long to celebrate something worth celebrating. In ancient Rome, they had tons of festivals and celebrations. Their prominent one, their, their biggest festival that they celebrated every year was a festival that was called Saturnalia. I probably butchered that, but you can kind of uh, get to it. It was a festival of celebrating their Roman god, Saturn. And this is a, a little idol of him. Um, he was the god over agriculture and time. Look at how they have kind of built him and depicted him. He is like the forerunner to both the Grim Reaper and Father Time. All right? Imagine those two guys together. That's Saturn. And they, their festival, Saturnalia, was the most joyful, joyous, rambunctious festival that they had all year long. It actually occurred December 17th through the 25th. With it came all kinds of things. They decorated their homes, because of the agriculture part, they decorated their homes in greenery, and they put wreaths on their doors. They were known, this festival was known for gambling, which I have to admit we did a little bit of uh, last week. If you've never played LCR, it's worth it. Left, center, right, I'll, I'll teach you later. Uh, the festival is known for lots of uh, joyful singing. Um, they would take their music from, from house to house, singing. And there are some of the uh, reports that I got when I was researching this that often those singers were naked. So it was joyful. Um, they, they love to give gifts during this time. And the gift giving was often, um, the most popular gift was wax candles. And the light from the candles was to mark the returning of the light during the solstice. Okay, Father Time. It was a big party. I think Roman Mardi Gras, right? It was a big party. And then came along Emperor Constantine. You know Constantine, he was the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity, and he actually moved Christianity in, from being a persecuted religion to being the state religion of Rome. And this king sitting on his throne watching this festival, now having expressed his allegiance to Christ, says, you want something to celebrate, let me give you something to celebrate. And in December, in, uh, December 25th of 336 AD, he marked the date of Jesus' birth. Now, I'm not going to start arguing with you, but 
most scholars kind of understand his birth to be closer to spring, actually closer to where we celebrate Easter, which is when Jesus died. But he marked it there because he was like, you know, let's, let's celebrate something really good here. Let me give you something worth celebrating. The best gift ever. You see, the king has come. His kingdom is here. And it is worth celebrating. That's what Jesus was doing in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's where we've been uh, as we're finishing up this series, The Best Gift Ever. We have looked at this season where the world stops, where Christianity stops, and, and we celebrate what we call Advent, the coming of the King. And we've taken a look at the Sermon on the Mount saying, okay, well, if he's come, what is he doing? And in Matthew chapter 4, right as he enters the Sermon on the Mount teaching, Jesus says, the kingdom is near. Repent. Like he starts this message of letting us know that the king has come and I'm bringing the kingdom. You need to pay attention to what I'm inviting you to. And the rest of his now Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5 through 7 is a, an explanation of what life in the kingdom of God can look like for us. And so we've celebrated the major markers of Advent by looking at his teachings. We've celebrated hope. And that because of Jesus we know that God does what he says he's going to do. Through Jesus, God fulfills all of his promises, dating all the way back to Abraham and moving forward. Through Jesus, the kingdom is established on earth as we wait for it in heaven. Through Jesus, we have hope. We have hope of a blessed life. Now, as we wait for it to be really good. And we become a people of hope. In his very language, we become salt and light to a world that is hopeless without him. And then we turned and we looked at peace. That through Jesus... We have true peace. We understand what it means to be at rest with God. That through Jesus, we understand that we don't have to prove or earn our way to God. We don't have to make a show of how we pray or how we give or show how mature we are spiritually by what well, we even fast. So take a look at this. Jesus invites us into peace with God, our Father who sees the unseen, who knows our hearts and allows us to live at rest with him. And because we live at rest with him, we are able to live at rest with people. He's a God of peace. We celebrated that Jesus is the God of joy. That because of Jesus, we are able to live in contentment beyond our current circumstances. And quite honestly, for some of us, this season is hard. And Jesus gives us renewed meaning there. We're able to live in the bigger picture than, rather than focusing right in this moment because we have a new sense of what's happening. We know where we're headed. 
And that's the kingdom of God, and we know who we are, and that's kingdom citizens. Because of this, we have a different perspective on life. We see others differently, as well as seeing our own experience differently. And what we saw in the Sermon on the Mount is because of that, we're able to stand with people in the midst of their struggle, even in the midst of their rebellion, rather than standing against them. We're not defined by judgment, but by solidarity with those who struggle. We're a people that, we're not free of evaluation, but we're free of condemnation. We're able to live with joy ourselves and we're able to extend joy by being a grace-filled people to others. And lastly, Jesus is the God of love. It's what Adam walked us into last week. That because of Jesus, we know the depths of God's love. Because of Jesus, we live expectant of his love. We Expect God to be really good to us. Instead of often like an unbelieving world expecting to get smited by the almighty smiter, right? We have, because of Jesus, we have the humility to ask for what we need. Because of Jesus, we have the boldness to seek him out actively. And because of Jesus, we have the perseverance to knock on God's door because we know he is a generous father. And his loving nature becomes the model for how we now live with others. We become a loving, generous people because that's what he's done for us. This is the picture of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is painting a picture of what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God now. To have a different kind of human experience on this earth. As scripture calls it, to actually live as the new humanity. A kingdom in the, of God in the midst of the kingdom of the world, living under the blessing of God with hope, peace, joy, and love defining our lives together. And Jesus is intent. It's littered all the way through this teaching. Jesus is intent on us becoming a people who hand this blessing off. He is intent on us actually being the best gift the world has ever seen. The church is the most powerful institution in the world because it is bringing the kingdom of God in the midst of the kingdom of the world. This is what we celebrate. Even in the midst of struggle, there is newness and joy and freedom. I believe this is a very clear, appropriate view of the Sermon on the Mount, of Jesus' teaching, and of how he understands the kingdom of God. But what's really interesting is as he closes this amazing teaching that you can spend your entire life just digging into, we only touched a couple of pieces of it. Like Jesus takes a turn in this teaching. And he does something different. It's like he's moved away from all of the, let me show you something else. Let me show you something else. And now he's he's closing it out. He's landing the plane, as we like to say when we teach. 
which my wife looks at me and she's like, that means land the plane, you're done. <laughs> so he's come into this place and he, it's like he, he puts a warning label on the kingdom of God. So you got some gifts during Christmas, probably. Any of them come with warning labels? Like, it's crazy what they have to put on, a, on, a, on anything nowadays. It's like we don't take any responsibility for ourselves, right? Let me show you a couple of warning labels that, that I have found. Take a look at, that's a letter opener. <laughs> Safety goggles recommended. These are not made up. These are real. Why do you need safety goggles for letter openers? Like, really? All right. Um, how about this one? Do not iron while wearing shirt. Now, this, I guarantee you this was built for college males. They pull the shirt out of the pile and they're going on a date and they're like, oh, you know, they just hit it really quick. Their brains are mush until they're 25. Just deal with them. How about this one? Chipotle. Drivers do not carry burritos. Actually printed on the back of their trucks. I want to know. I want to know who was the guy that caused this warning sign. Like, running them down, honking, telling them, pull over, I'm hungry. People are hilarious. All right, so the next one. Now, it, it's really cute and all, but the green apple color does not mean eat, does it? Like, who's going to, do they think it's candy that plays music? All right, last one. This is my favorite because I'm a granddad now. No, I've, I, when I was a young dad, I left two of my kids in the car. Um, one at Toys R Us, and as soon as I closed the door, I was like, ah! And the other one, like, was Bryson. That was Brady. Reagan never got left. She was, she was my princess. <laughs> when, with Bryson, I left him in, in the parking lot and went in to go eat Mexican food, and I was like, huh? Just forgot. <laughs> but <laughs> how did... How do you leave your child in the stroller while you... <laughs> People are stupid. Okay. This is what Jesus is doing when he gets to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He gets to the end of his teaching and he's like, all right, stupid people, pay attention. I need to like walk you into how this is going to go, I need to give a disclaimer. And if one disclaimer wasn't enough, like he put, he put multiple warning signs on, the, on his package. It wasn't just one. Let me show you his warning about the kingdom of God. This is what he says. Matthew 7 Verse 13. He says, Enter through the narrow gate. For the wide gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. He's like, Wait a second, warning. I've talked to you about the kingdom of God. I've talked to you about a blessed life. I've talked to you about a new way, but make sure you go my way here. 
You see, the disconnected are outside of the kingdom of God. The disconnected are not following Jesus' way, but rather they're going their own way. They're not learning what it means to be a renewed humanity. They're swimming in the pool of broken people. They're not receiving the the life-saving blessings of God. You know, of hope and peace. Living without sustaining joy. And with no unconditional love. They're not experiencing the best gift ever. In this life and in the life to come. Just like. I've shown you what life looks like. Or will you follow me into it? Is this question. He continues. He gives warning number two. And he says it this way. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Verse 18. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So he starts with a warning, a disclaimer for for all of us saying, okay, I've shown you the way. Will you follow me into the way? And then he turns and he's like, there are going to be those who, instruct you in the way. Both good church people and teachers and pastors who are going to be telling you that they're inviting you into the kingdom of God through following Jesus. But that's not what they're doing. He calls them false prophets. There are two types of false prophets, I believe, that Jesus is warning us about. The first, first are, are people who speak the message of Jesus' life and hope in his kingdom, but they remove what it means to Follow Jesus' way. You know, the way of the cross. They remove what it means to die to ourselves and and live for him. And eerily, the call for transformation in our lives is, is just absent. You can't read the Sermon on the Mount and get to that conclusion. The the second kind of false teacher that I believe that Jesus is pointing us to is, is those that teach that full gospel of Jesus, but choose to accept it themselves. You know, they, they teach love your enemies, but but they hate their neighbor. They teach, quoting Sermon on the Mount, they teach, don't lust for someone in your heart, but they sleep with somebody else's spouse. They teach, don't make a show of your giving and prayers and your fasting, 
but they constantly work for applause from someone else. And they correct people for their good, but they seem to to enjoy punishing people who struggle. Jesus warns us, I believe, about both of these false prophets. Those who water down his message and those who don't live his message. And his response is that both of them are dangerous. There's a warning sign for them. And his instruction is you'll know them by their fruit. What does that mean? It means you'll know them by the results that they produce. You'll know them by the result of their teaching and by the result of their lives. The questions that we need to ask, do they bring hope to the hopeless? Do they live a life of peace and increase peace with others between God and people? Do they move through life with joy and lead others to a life of contentment, even when people are struggling? Do they love like the Father, a radical, relentless, never-ending pursuit of both the people of God and of the disconnected world? Then, it's almost like the, the baby stroller warning. He's like, if you haven't heard me yet, let me be clear. And he gets really clear with us about following him into the kingdom. And this is what he says. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father and who, who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. See, here's the deal. Jesus is the king of the kingdom. And there is no way into the kingdom except through him and following him into it. It doesn't matter how much we teach about Jesus if our teaching isn't causing people to enter the kingdom of God. If it's not filling them with hope, joy, peace, and love, if it's not changing their experience as being a human being, and it doesn't matter all the good things that we do in the name of Jesus, if it doesn't fuel transformed lives around us. We could get all the applause from people that we want. And those things just don't matter. See, Jesus paints this beautiful picture of what new life can be. It's like he he closes the picture off with his signature saying, do you trust me in this? Are you willing to go my way? Are Are you willing to follow me here? Because if you do, I've got a life full of blessing. I've got a life 
It's unlike anything else. And as he always does, Jesus, the master storyteller, tells one final story to go along with his three warning stickers. Because I think sometimes we learn best through story. And he says it like this. He says, anyone who hears my words and and puts them into practice. It's like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down. And the streams rose and the winds blew against his rock. But that, that house stood firm. Because its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears my words and does not put them into practice he's like a, a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and, and the wind blew against that house and Great was the crash of that house.